Amen. Well, let's, uh, let's get into God's Word this morning. Uh, I want to speak from the book of Psalms this morning, and specifically, I, I want to preach from Psalm 46, Psalm 46. And uh, Psalm 46 is, is uh, in many ways, going to contain verses that you will have known already, very familiar to you, but I want to actually preach the whole psalm this morning. There, there are bits and bobs that you'll hear repeated, even in Christianese and even in worship songs. Some of the lines from Psalm 46 will come to your memory this morning, uh, but I want to preach it uh, as a whole this morning and, uh, and then apply it to our life today. And if I could sum up Psalm 46 in this way, uh, I would say that Psalm 46 has this one simple message, and that is peace in unspeakable trouble. Peace in unspeakable trouble. You know, the frustrating thing about Christianity is that uh, Christians still have trouble. I find that really annoying. <laughs> I mean, I've inherited the fullness of God's kingdom. I'm seated in Christ. I'm in heavenly places. Uh, as Christ is in this world, so am I. Yet I still seem to encounter trouble. Is anyone else frustrated by that? Like, that's so annoying. Uh, I don't know why God came up with that system, but he has. Uh, so we're just going to roll with it and uh, trust him uh, that he knows what he's doing. And I guess that's also one of the themes that really comes through in Psalm 46, that in the midst of this trouble um, and, and un, a, a, an unspeakable peace can also come to your life that it doesn't need to be one or the other. But actually, one of the big aspects of faith isn't an absence of trouble, but in the midst of trouble, you can experience peace. And that, in many ways, is, is what great faith is about. Uh, we, we see in the chapter of faith in Hebrews 11 that, that many of these guys endured uh, unspeakable trouble, but yet they were moved by who God was and the faithfulness that He had demonstrated in their past, present, and future. Now, Psalm 46, once again, as, as most things, particularly in the Old Testament, pertain to a historical moment in the nation of Israel and to God's people. And so even from the history of Psalm 46, as we set a bed of context for us to extrapolate from, we, we see that Psalm 46 uh, is, is attributed to the sons of Korah. However, it's, it's, it's thought that actually it was a psalm written for the sons of Korah, not by the sons of Korah. And that Psalm 46 is part of three Psalms, 46, 47, 48, which possibly and probably were written by King Hezekiah after a great battle uh, that God delivered Israel through. And so these are really uh, Psalms of, of speaking of God's uh, sovereignty over all the nations and over all the trouble. Uh, Psalm 46 specifically is talking about a personal defense for God's people. And I want you to know that God is your personal defense. He's your shield this morning. God uh, is the one who comes to your side. But then Psalm 46 flows into Psalm 47, which talks about the universal reign and enthronement of God. So God is your defense. Uh, he is your personal Lord and Savior, but He also enjoys a universal reign, uh, that actually He is the one who holds the whole world in His hand. And then Psalm 48 sums up uh, and rounds out these three Psalms by talking about the complete and final victory of God. Hallelujah. So it's a personal defense and victory and proving of God's faithfulness in your life and in God's people uh, but then it also goes to a universal reign that over the whole earth God reigns. But then also it rounds it out by saying over all time, human history, creation, the universe, there is a complete and final victory which belongs to the Lord God Most High. And so even if you are right this morning in the darkest hour you have ever experienced, even that alone, the fact that there are three Psalms, that just highlight the facts that personally, universally, and over all time, God is in control. That's an encouragement to me this morning. Because we can get lost in the forest with being obsessed with the trees. And we see the trees of our life, but God is, he's building a forest 
And, and so we want to explore Psalm 46 because it really speaks to the people of God. And, and even though historically this is written by Hezekiah, that was uh, really a message of proving God's faithfulness. I want, you, I want it to speak to you this morning that historically it's speaking about God's people, but spiritually it, it can be aligned to your life this morning. And I pray it blesses you. Let's open up with a word of prayer. God, we, we humbly and in surrender come to you this morning. And, and God, we prepare our hearts to hear from you directly. And God, we, we say, speak to us in whatever way you want. Lord, we're going to be obedient to your word. And you have full permission, Holy Spirit, uh, to, to, to do whatever surgery you want on our hearts and our soul. Uh, Lord, let the word of God be a two-edged sword this morning that's performing surgery on our life as we submit to your goodness and your faithfulness. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Well, let's, let's open up uh, Psalm 46. Uh, like I said, it was written probably by Hezekiah for the sons of Korah, but then it actually goes on and, and says that it, it's a song for Alamoth. Uh, which you all know. And um, no, I didn't know either. I had to look it up. Alamoth is, a, uh, is actually a reference to, to maidens. That it was actually, this song was written for, for females or for sopranos. And so, because we're a Bible believing church, uh, we're all going to get the maidens to stand up. And um, if you're a maiden, you're going to have to sing Psalm 46 this morning. Um, <laughs> bit, of, bit of nervous laughter there. <laughs> Like, is he joking? Yeah, I'm joking. Uh, but this is, so it's a song. So the idea of this that you need to take away is that this is a song. Uh, that, that this is a worship call uh, from God's people uh, about his faithfulness and everything that he has done in his past. And it starts out here, and you'll recognize this first verse. It says, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. And there's that word again, trouble. Uh, it doesn't say God is our refuge and our strength, the actual promise that you will never have any trouble. I mean, if I was writing the Bible, that's what I would write. But, but it's, the fact is that God is a very present help in trouble. That, that, that the people of God encounter trial and, and suffering from time to time, but he is a very present help in that trouble. If you got trouble this morning, I want you to know that God is in that trouble with you. You are not alone. The, the reason that God is our refuge and our strength, we, we are encouraged to know that God's people find safety, shelter, sanctuary, that in God. Our sanctuary and our shelter is in God. It, it's also a reminder that He is our power and our might, our fortitude. He is our strength. He is our shelter, our, our, our refuge, but he is also our strength. He is our fortitude. He is the one who gives us power to live on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, he is also the, the reason for our courage. You may be in the midst of a terrible storm right now. God himself is your reason for courage in the midst of that storm. In the midst of that storm. That storm that happened uh, Christmas Eve, we... Bonnie and I were driving, we were driving around with the family this week and uh, we were sort of heading out, you know, the back of Wonga Wallen and out the back of Upper Coomera and sort of up towards Mount Tambourine. And, um, and those suburbs, they, they got hit hard. There were trees everywhere. And, uh, and it really, there, there was a report that came out that, you know, it was a tornado and I thought, oh my goodness, that's just exaggeration. We don't have tornadoes in Australia, right? But dri <laughs> driving through those suburbs, it was a tornado. It was a tornado, like that... There was absolute destruction everywhere. It's the worst storm that we've had, I, I reckon, in southeast Queensland. You know, it's the worst storm. I went to sleep in that storm. <laughs> it was starting as I just went to bed, and I fell asleep. Didn't wake up till the morning. Now, not to make light of the storm, because it was, it was, it, it's, it, it's done some damage to some people's homes, uh, but, I, but this is the picture that really Christians should have is the anointing to fall asleep in storms to find peace like there is a storm raging outside my house I'm fast asleep there is they, they said 30,000 strikes of lightning and I did not open an eyelid <laughs> that's the picture of a Christian though I'm just I'm just I'm just a good Christian, that's all. <laughs> so, 
So if you woke up in that storm, well, <laughs> I'll open up the altar later. And <laughs> God's word says there's going to be storms, but he's going to be your refuge and your strength, your courage to find rest and peace in the midst of adversity. When the world is raging, God's people can be at peace. Why? Uh, The psalm goes on to answer it uh, in in this way. He's a very present help in trouble. Why can we find peace in the psalm? Because he's there. He's present. He's in the midst of it. He he, he sees you. you. You're not invisible. Your situation isn't unknown by God. Your circumstance has been noted by heaven. And, and he's invaded that moment of your life and he's saturated it with his presence. He's standing there right in the midst of that trouble, right in the midst of that storm. He's there. He's a very present, a very present help in trouble. You must say, well, I don't feel Jesus. I don't feel him. I don't feel God. Uh, that, that, that feeling can't dictate your faith. He's there. The Word of God says he's there. You may not feel him. You may not see him. You may not see any evidence that he's there outside of the word of God telling you God is there in the midst, a very present help in trouble. Don't ever mistake your circumstance for the nearness of God, ever. No situation determines whether or not God is there with you. He's already said, I'll never leave you. I'm not going to forsake you. I'm a very present help in trouble in the midst of your darkest hour. Guess who's standing there with the light? It's Jesus Christ himself. He will be there in every single situation that you experience. In 1 John, we see that the apostle highlights for us in, in his epistles in verse 17 of chapter four. He says, love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Why? Because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. Perfect love casts out fear. When we experience the love of God, when we have lived and experientially known on an intimate level God's love, then fear should not and, we, and must not be the outcome of that. Yeah. Right. If we're understanding God's perfect love, then we need to constantly draw our eyes, our attention, our soul and our spirit back to that perfect love because our propensity in our human nature is to be distracted by the fear. Yeah. Right. It's natural humor, I need to look at this fear. Yeah. I, I need to pay attention to what might be going wrong. Anxiety is just something that goes on in my family. It's just something that I've always lived with. I don't know why I'm anxious, but it's just the way I am. No, as he is, so are you in this world, a perfect love. Now, I'm not saying that it's, that it's necessarily, what I'm saying is, it's just that we need to constantly make an effort to rest in that love. Get your eyes off the circumstance, off the situation, off the fear, because if you're focused on the perfect love of Jesus Christ, reminding it and rehearsing it in your mind, in your soul, in your spirit, then fear cannot be the outcome and must, and must not be the outcome. Do not fear is as much a commandment as it is an encouragement. Do not fear it, it is a biblical standard of a person of faith. And we are encouraged to not fear, because why? Because in God's perfect love, all, all fear has been removed. Amen. Psalm 46 highlights this itself in verse two. It says, therefore, we will not fear. Why? What, it's therefore, what's the therefore? It's because he's a refuge, our strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. So when you're looking at the trouble, be reminded of refuge, strength, courage, power, and the presence of God. God, I know I'm facing adversity. God, I know I'm facing a storm right now. God, I'm facing a crisis in my life right now, but I know that you are with me. And because I know you are with me, it doesn't necessarily instantaneously remove the trouble, but it does remove the fear. 
It does remove the fear. The presence of God may not, may not remove adversity instantaneously, although at times that happens as well, and we'll believe for that, we'll pray for that. But I'll tell you what it does remove. It removes the fear from your life. It removes the fear from that situation. It even goes on and, and, and really uses some literary devices in this next verse and a half of just how troublesome the world can be. And through, and sorry, and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea. You might have read that verse, and that might have been the very first thing that resonated with you this morning. Because that's what your life feels like. It feels like the mountains of your life have been thrown into the midst of the sea. That's okay. The psalmist has got this covered. Even though that's how you feel, even though the, 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 the world that you live in has been turned upside down, the stead rock hard mountains of your life, the steadfast places of your life, even though they've been turned upside down, even in that, even in that, God's presence is with you. Even in absolute turmoil, God's presence is there. Though its waters roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with its swelling. Selah, ponder that, think about that, meditate on that. Your broken world is not a result of a loving God. God is the remedy. God is the, the source of the healing, the source of the wholeness. He is the master physician, the expert craftsman. He's molding something out of this. And part of the reason why perfect love can cast out all fear is because we know as the people of God, all things work together for the good of those. It might not be tomorrow, it might not be in a decade, but all things will work together for the good of those who love the Lord and are called according to His purposes. Sometimes what helps us in faith is to get a bit more of a helicopter view. And really, if Psalm 46, 47, 48 are doing anything, it's giving us a helicopter view over the providence and sovereignty of God. God is in control, but He controls it through His goodness. It's like God's not just in control and has no feeling or emotion or, or intent in that control. No, God is in control and it's in His goodness and His mercy that He administers that control. And so even in the midst of trouble, we know that all things will work together for the good that God intended and will get our life back to and we'll get creation back to, and we'll get the universe back to. We've gone awry. There was a mistake. There was, there was a, a journeying into a wilderness, but God brings us back to that. And even though in the wilderness there are battles and there are enemies, all things work together for the good of those who call upon the Lord. Let's have a look at a macro view of God's faithfulness in Jeremiah 17, verses 5 to 8. It says this, thus says the Lord, cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength, who, whose heart departs from the Lord. For he shall be like a shrub in the desert and shall not see when good comes, but shall inhabit the parched places in the wilderness, in a salt land which is not inhabited. But notice the contrast of that. In verse seven, blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord and whose hope is in the Lord. For he shall be like a tree planted by waters. Trust and hope is like water to your soul. You can survive a lack of a lot of things, but a lack of hope, that's something you can't survive. And that's why one of the most imperative things that we ever got from the cross was the hope of Jesus Christ. Because it doesn't matter how dark your day gets. It doesn't matter how bad the situation gets. The hope, the anchor, the foundation of our future glory in Christ Jesus is the hope of the cross, of His work and ministry in my life. I know He's a miracle-working God, which probably means I'm going to need a miracle at some point. Otherwise, it's a redundant job description, isn't it? I know He's the healer, which might mean I might need some healing at some point. And it's the hope in His healing, it's the hope in His restoration that is the anchor of my soul. And when I, when I 
fix my eyes on that hope, I'm gonna be like a tree planted by the waters. It nourishes, it feeds, it waters, it brings life, spreads out its roots by the river and will not fear when heat comes. When the heat of life gets turned up, I'm not gonna fear that heat because my leaves are gonna be green. I'll not be anxious in the year of drought nor cease from yielding fruit. I love the fact that people of God are called to bear fruit in drought. Everyone else, the economy might be in drought. I'm bearing fruit. Everyone else might be uh, living in, in, in fear of the future. I'm living in hope and, and yielding fruit. Why? Because my anchor, the, the water of my soul is the hope that I have in Jesus Christ. Let's, let's throw, there's some imagery here, really, of the Garden of Eden, because it says the river, if you, if you notice uh, in verse 4, it goes on to say, there is a river whose streams shall make glad the city of God. There is a river whose streams, there's some imagery here that, that throws back to the Garden of Eden. There was, there was four uh, rivers that came out of Eden, and let's have a look at these rivers in, in Genesis chapter 2. Verse 10, it says this, Now a river went out of Eden to water the garden. A river came out of Eden to water the garden. And just have some imagery there that, that essentially uh, there, is a, there, there is a temple, uh, there is a temple motif in the garden that you have creation, which is the outer court. You have Eden, which is the inner court. But then notice that Eden isn't the garden. There's a garden in Eden. And that's the holy of holies. That, that, that's the dwelling place of God. That's where perfection was. And Adam was charged with taking that perfect presence and blessing of God and expanding it across Eden and expanding it across creation. A job that we now have inherited uh, through the second Adam, Jesus Christ, one that we're co-laborers in, to take the perfected will of God in Jesus Christ and to his kingdom come, his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's now our co-laborer commissioning with God. Uh, but notice what flows into that garden. There's a river out of Eden to water the garden, and from it there it parted and became four riverheads. And the four riverheads were the, the Pishon, the Tigris, the Gihon, and the Euphrates. And uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure if this is part of the notes or not, uh, but the, these four rivers have names and, and meanings from these streams that flow out of that garden of Eden. And, and the Pishon uh, it means increase. That the Spirit of God, the rivers of God flowing through your life will bring an increase to whatever area that water touches. The, the rivers of, of the Spirit of God in you brings increase to whatever it waters. It, it might be your home life. It might be, it might be your thought life. It, it might be uh, your, the way in which you conduct your friendships. It might be your business. Whatever it is, that, that there is a, a life-giving river from Jesus himself that brings increase. Uh, the Gihon uh, is bursting forth. I love that picture that, it's, that even though it's a still stream, a peaceful river, as opposed to the raging seas that we've seen in Psalm 46. The raging seas are contrasted with there is a river, a peaceful river. But make sure you understand that river is bursting forth that you can't contain the life-giving spirit that is breathed into you. It'll bring increase, but I tell you what, it is waiting just to burst forth out of your life. It, don't contain it. Don't build a damn wall in your soul of the spirit of God in you. Let it burst forth. Let it flow. Don't be afraid to run out. You won't run out. It, it's a spirit given without measure. It brings increase and it's bursting forth. The tigress means arrow-like, that, that there is a military and swift-moving aspect of defense that comes to this river as well, that, that there is a protection of that life-giving spirit that comes from your soul. And the last one, there is the Euphrates, which means fruitfulness. That there is a fruitfulness from God's spirit that comes from your life. That there is an increase bursting forth from you that is arrow-like that brings fruitfulness. Let me say that again. There is an increase that is bursting forth that is arrow-like that produces fruitfulness in your life. 
That's the Spirit of God in you. And it's also the guarantee, back to Psalm 46, that there is a river whose streams shall make glad the city of God, the holy place, the tabernacle of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. Who's her? Well, now we get into some sort of just a, a, a common, fairly common biblical metaphor or imagery. Let's, let's call it biblical imagery. That in many ways, Jerusalem is an actual city. There is an earthly Jerusalem and a heavenly Jerusalem. But Jerusalem is also a picture of the people of God. And, and we see this in Revelation 21 primarily, which we'll go to in a minute. Uh, but I just want to explain who the her there is. So historically, we're talking about Israel. Spiritually, this is also talking about you. That God is in the midst. Where is the temple of God now? Where is the dwelling place of God now? Yeah. In us. Yeah, that's right. This is where the streams come from. So it doesn't matter what situation I'm in. You can put me in any situation. I'm in this situation now. I've still got a river bursting forth from within me that is increasing and it's bringing fruitfulness. You can move me to a situation over here. I'm now in a situation over here. This could be a storm. This is a bad storm over here. It's a bad storm, but there's a river in me called the Spirit of God, the faithfulness of God, the grace of God, His life-giving Spirit that is bursting forth in increase, that is arrow-like, and is producing fruitfulness in my life. There may be a situation where the seas are raging, but the seas are raging are contrasted by that inner river of peace that God has breathed into my soul. It's a river of increase. It's a river bursting forth. It's the Spirit of God in me. I now, as the people of God, have God's dwelling up of His presence in my life. Here's the promise to God's people. She shall not be moved. She shall not be moved. Don't move unless God's moved you. Because God's word is, you won't be moved. God shall help her just at the break of dawn. The nations raged, the kingdoms were moved. Once again, let's, let's throw back to historical here. At the moment, this psalm is being written consequently to victories against the enemies of God's people, Ammon, uh, Syria, uh, th these are some pretty nasty and, and, and very large enemies. These guys completely dominated Israel and dominated most of, uh, you know, that area of, of Israel and Judea. Uh, that was only part of their empire at that time, the Assyrian Empire. It, there was a large, very violent people called the Assyrian people that are dominating God's people at the moment, yet God proved faithful in that, and now the testimony is God shall help her. They're talking from experience here. They're rehearsing the victories that God has already performed. One of the greatest things that you could ever do in faith is to rehearse the victories that God has already performed in your life. You may be in a storm right now. Throw your mind back to the last storm where God proved his faithfulness. That'll help you in this storm. It, 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 it's when you're in the midst of a battle, in the midst of complete turmoil, throw your mind back to the last victory that God proved himself faithful in. That's going to help you in this battle. Get, get well practiced at rehearsing the victories of God's past testimony of faithfulness in your life. You got to rehearse it. Don't be one of the major problems that the people of Israel had is they quickly forgot the victories of Egypt. They weren't in the wilderness 37 minutes and they're like, oh, we're going to die. And, and God's in heaven, like, oh, for goodness sake. Do you guys not remember the plagues? Pharaoh, slavery, freedom. You guys, this ringing any bells? This is just a desert. I'm pretty sure I got this covered. All right? Same with us. We get into a situation where we're like, oh my goodness, God's not going to come through this time. This is my end. This is, this is me done. Stick a fork in me. I'm, it's over. <laughs> and God's in heaven like, don't you remember 2010 when I saw you through that, that, that family situation? Don't you remember 2015 when, when, I, when I brought that breakthrough to your life? Don't you remember when, when you were a teenager and you cried out to me and I answered you and I was there? Yeah. Don't you remember? And that you've got to get 
well-versed at practicing the God's proven faithfulness in your past because you need it for your today. Get good at rehearsing God's faithfulness. The nations raged, the kingdoms were moved. One of the things that is so reassuring to us is that, is that God actually controls the nation. Psalm 2 uh, is, is a famous conversation that happens between the Trinity. And, and the Trinity are talking to each other here. And in, in Psalm 2, uh, part of the conversation starts out like this. It says in verse 1, why do the nations rage? Now, I can just imagine like God looking down on an anthill. Why do the nations rage? <laughs> it's kind of the imagery I get. You know, like, like we, we would look down at Antio, why, why are you guys so angry? <laughs> Don't you know I'm, I'm about to pour petrol down your Antio? Yeah. <laughs> 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 There's no point getting angry about it. I'm in control right now. That's just my, that's my imagery anyway. Why, why do the nations rage? And the people plot a vain thing. What are you all going to do? You having a meeting right now? It, 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 there's no, there's no, you're plotting a vain thing. The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed saying, let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us. Listen to God's response. He who sits in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall hold them in derision. Then he shall speak to them in his wrath and distress them in his deep displeasure. It brings great comfort to the people of God, not only knowing that he's in control of our life, but actually he's in control of the nations. He's in control of all the kings, the politicians, the captains of industry, the the various and nefarious forces that, that at times cause us concern None of them, uh, they plot a vain thing if they ever think they're going to overthrow the sovereignty of God. It's just just not going to happen. He who sits in the heavens laughs. And so when we see chaos, not only in our life, but when we see chaos in the world, then we can also join in God's laughter. Why? Because we know he's in control. We know God is in control. He added his voice, the earth melted, the Lord of hosts is with us. And notice this again, the God of Jacob is our refuge. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Notice that he uses the word Jacob there instead of Israel. Now God changed Jacob's name to Israel, but the psalmist here is using the name Jacob. Why? Because there's almost an emphasis on the humanity of Jacob, that even in our most human moments, Even in the moments that really the name Jacob reminds us of his weaknesses and his mistakes, his trickery and his deceit, as opposed to Israel, the the, the mighty father of faith and the the father of, of the 12 tribes. No, it's Jacob in the human incompleteness and imperfections. But even that man, Jacob, the imperfect human, God is the refuge. You don't earn God's refuge. You don't earn his shelter. He's given it to you. He's chosen you for it. You didn't choose him for refuge. He chose you to come into his refuge. Yeah, yeah, well, I'm I'm not good enough to experience God's refuge. I had nothing to do with that in the first place. That's a pretty arrogant assumption that you could even attain that, really. That's a, that's a couple of tickets on yourself there, that, that there is even a day that you could have that could earn any, any even just the most minuscule part of God's righteousness. Don't fool yourself. It was only because God chose you to be his righteousness that now you are his refuge. He loved you first. The psalm from, from verse 8 on really takes a, a, a turn of focus. It's now going to switch from a historical outlook and start looking futuristic. And, and this is quite, um, the, ter- the term would be eschatological, which means a focus on the end. And eschatology is just a theological term to sum up four simple concepts. Uh, heaven, hell, 
judgment and last things. That's just a broad term of theology. And so this psalm is now switching its attention to the proven faithfulness of God in the past and now switching its focus to the plans of God that are encompassed around heaven, hell, judgment, and last things. In other words, how God is going to bring this human story and human history to an end. God's also in control of that. Thank goodness. Kind of feels like the earth is spinning out of control at times. No, things aren't falling out of control. Things are falling into place because God holds the future as well. And so even in the future, the Psalm 46 speaks to our personal contemplation of what that looks like. He says, it's almost an invitation here. Well, it's not almost. It is an invitation here. Come, behold the works of the Lord. So we're, we're beckoned to cast our mind forward to consider God's works. Who made the desolations of the earth. He makes wars cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and, and cuts the spear in two. He burns the chariot in the fire. And this famous verse, which is really where we want to land, says this, be still and know that I am God. Amen. Now, let's put that in context. Like I said, this is now a psalm that is focused on the future. A psalm that is talking about the ultimate judgment of God, where he is going to pour out his judgment on the nations, where mountains are going to be moved, there is going to be turmoil, there is going to be God's wrath poured out on the planet, there is going to be uh, complete destruction, and, and there is going to be justice. He's going to bring peace, he's going to break the bow, he's going to remove war, he's going to establish his kingdom of peace in full, and in the midst of that turmoil, where God is bringing justice to the earth, in that moment, the invitation and the beckoning is to be still, and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am God. So whether it is God administering his goodness and justice and removal of war, or whether or not it is God pouring out wrath on the nations, in both extremities of God's perfect justice and mercy, the posture of the believer is to be still and know that it's God's sovereign hand of providence that is at work. So you've got the whole spectrum covered. Past, know that God is faithful. Future, know that God is going to be faithful. God's greatest peace and justice. In His perfect peace, Lack of war, know that God is faithful. And everything in between, everything in between, down to the small moments of our life, know that God is faithful. Why? Because He's a very present help in trouble. What, what does this look like? What does this look like? Well, it, there's two aspects of application here that we could do this week. Uh, the first one is practice the promise of God. Yeah. Practice the promise of God. Right. Some of us just need reminding the promise of God. You might have a situation, you might be stepping into something this year and you just need to be reminded of God's promise. That, that God is your healer, that God is your saviour, that He is your deliverer, yeah. that He brings peace in the midst of trouble that He has positioned you as His righteousness. Some of you need to be reminded of that. Yeah. Some of you still got shame and guilt in your life, even though you've been elevated to the position of son. So just remind yourself of the promise this week. Monday morning, start the week reminding yourself of just one promise. Just one. You've got a couple to choose from in the Bible. <laughs> just choose one. And just remind yourself of that one. And just practice that all week. Because that'll help you just be still and know that I am God. And here's the other one that we talked about. Just rehearse a past victory. I want you to practice God's faithfulness this, this, year, uh, this week. sorry. Monday morning, tomorrow, what I want you to do, I want you just to write down just one. Just choose one. 
one proven demonstration of God's faithfulness in your past and just remind yourself of it. Because when you remind yourself of God's future promise and God's proven faithfulness, it'll help you be still and know that He is God. Come on, let's stand in the presence of the Lord.